Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. Our keynote speaker is the only two-time keynote speaker for Keenvention. She's just that good. So I invited her to come back. Uh, last year, she gave us the State of the Free State Project. We know that the Free State Project is doing well. It's on its way to making its goal of 20,000. We're over 16,000 today. So rather than talking about the State of the Free State Project, she had something that she wanted to present. She's been doing a lot of research. Her name is Carla Garrick. She's the president of that Free State State project for how many years now Carla how many years have you been the president it's been three two since 2011 so she's not burned out yet which is a testament to this lady's amazing ability to keep at uh, activism and uh, I'm just it's it's an honor to have you back here thank you Carla and uh, so she's gonna talk about the 1960s and the activism from back then I think this is what I was told and uh, and what can we learn what can we learn from back then that we can apply today? At least that's what I understand of it, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, Carla Garrick, president of the Free State Project, welcome to Keenvention again. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me back. It's, it's actually an honor. You know, I think uh, people forget that we are trying to build something within a voluntary society and that that can be hard because you have to figure out where you build your bridges, where you burn your bridges, and how you make things progress without using force or coercion. And so it's, it's a constant balance, and I will be talking today a little bit about balance between various things. I will also somehow work in the 60s, <laughs> because I, I did do a, a bunch of research about it, and I think it is something that can help inform us of course, as Ian said, the Free State Project is a, depending on who watches this video, I could go with various definitions of what it is, but really what it is to me in the truest sense of what words mean is it's a radical social venture, it's a movement to bring like-minded people who really, really understand issues together so that we can foment a new word and a, a world. And I don't even use the word foment lightly. I think that we should come together, we should have dialogue, we should talk, and we should figure out what is the best way to get from here to there. So one of the ways that you can get from here to there, of course, is to learn from history. Because we aren't in a vacuum. This, these situations have come up before. And I was sort of intrigued mostly with the 60s and anything onwards from there in terms of what worked, what didn't work, what was a beautiful disaster, what can we learn from these people, what did they do right, what did they do wrong, what are we doing right, what could we do better, and sort of figure that out. Um, Decentralization, I think, is one of the most important things in a voluntary society, right? It's, it doesn't mean that there aren't people who are sort of in charge of a project or leading the charge on something. It simply means that there is a decentralized way that things get done. I actually have, as president, really tried to encourage that. And something like Keenvention and the Free Coast Festival, which happened in September, are testaments to that. It's an issue of really empowering people to say, well, this is the flavor of the festival I want to have. So, you know, the Free State Project has Pork Fest. We have the upcoming Liberty Forum, which will be March 5th through 8th. Then be sure to buy tickets. That's nhlibertyforum.com. Look at me being all professional. <laughs> but go there and definitely buy your ticket and come to that. That's a, a big event where people come together. But an event like this is crucial and important too because it brings together possibly a different flavor of people or people who are interested in something else or literally just geographically close to here. And I have met movers who came to convention last year, and this was the clincher for them, and that's all I want. If we do it, and we stand here, and we spread our ideas of freedom and peaceful evolution, then, you know, it doesn't matter what the forum is. So thank you, Ian, for having me at convention. 
I'm excited to be here. I have no idea what I'm going to say next. I ran into Derek J in the parking lot on the way in, and I was like, ah! And anyone who knows me as a speaker knows I have very grandiose ideas. I think about them for months and months, and I'll watch documentaries, and I'll read books, and I'll, and then I'll just, I'll do that. And then any normal public speaker would go write a speech, but I don't do that. Basically what I do is like 40 minutes to an hour before I'm gonna get up on stage, I go sit in the bar, I have one shot of tequila, I have one glass of wine, and I write whatever is gonna come out. So sometimes it's like meh, sometimes it's awesome, we'll see how it goes tonight. What I would like, what Derek said was, just tell us what's on your mind. So, because my mind's crammed with a whole bunch of crap, <laughs> I will do that. So I want to talk about being aware of what you're doing. I want to talk a little bit about what are goals and what are your motivations for things. I want to talk about the possibilities of mass collaboration within a voluntary society, which kind of means like the words mass collaboration scare me a little because it's like, eh, what? That sounds a little socialist. But those words actually come out of a Hayek essay. So I think the ideas of sort of how do we collaborate, how are we self-aware, how are we the most powerful we can be, are important things that we should start to really embrace. In between all of this, I am somehow going to weave some 60s stuff. I'm not sure how it's gonna work, but well, you know, bear with me. So, I originally entitled this speech, Steal This Speech. And I stole that title from Steal This Book, which was written by um, Abby Hoffman, who you know, was a big activist. He was part of the Chicago Eight. He was uh, one of the founders of the Yippie Movement, if you could argue that there could be founders of something like the Yippie Movement. And um, one of the things I really loved about the concept of him saying, steal this book and therefore steal this speech was even back then and you know we can count back we're talking over 50 years people 50 years of the you know that we've been talking about these issues figuring them out and i'm going to keep repeating the term peaceful evolution because i think it is a very core concept that we really need to get into so even back then A.B. Hoffman understood that, you know, IP is probably not a good proposition. If you want your ideas to spread, you want them to spread far and wide, and you want people to copy them. You want them to replicate them. If you want to be scientific, you want to be the virus of the mind. We want our liberty ideas to be Ebola. I worked Ebola into this speech, I get points, come on, Chris. <laughs> so really what we're talking about is open sourcing freedom, right? We want to take the concepts of freedom and we want to open source them. You know, Jimmy Wales, who's the co-founder of Wikipedia, I am courting, I guess would be a word for it, <laughs> him, um, I would really love him to come to Liberty Forum in March. Um, for every speaker that I approach, I write a very, very, very customized, appealing letter, finding out like what their buttons are, really, really trying to tailor it to what would appeal to that person. So in doing research for Jimmy Wales, I discovered various random things, but one thing that was like, oh, I bet if I put this on the subject line, he will reply, was he's a self-declared monarch. Monarch, as in a queen or a king, I guess. <laughs> and I was like, oh, dude, subject line, as one monarch to another. And he bit, and he bit hard, and I've spent the last week debating him. The thing that I found fascinating, and I will get to his quote in a second, was he, um, he was hooked. 
he went, he went to nhlibertyforum.com. He, um, he came back and he was like, how could you have uh, Ross Ulbricht from Silk Road or his mother speak at your event? And I was kind of like, Whoa? And I was like, um, because I don't know, Bitcoin plus free markets versus prosec gross prosecutorial misconduct and government overreach and blah, blah, blah. So for the past week, we have been having this debate. I'm not sure who's gonna win. We'll see if he comes or not, and then we'll know. But the reason I brought up Jimmy is because he was inspired by an essay by Hayek, and it was uh, Mark Thornton at the Von Mises Institute who actually gave him a copy of this essay probably 20, 25 years ago at this stage, right? And just that act of giving this person a copy of this essay spawned Wikipedia for us. The Hayek essay is called The Use of Knowledge in a Society, right? And it's all about decentralization and how we can have mass collaboration through decentralization. And I think that should really be a theme and something that we should start to put on the, our forefronts of our minds is how do we actually collaborate positively in order to change the world through knowledge. Um, I'm gonna jump around, I was gonna go to the 60s, but I do wanna mention this. I have a uh, writing group that I started, and um, for those of you who know me, no, I'm a recovering lawyer. I also have a master in fine arts in creative writing. Um, I really love writing. I actually decided to be a writer on the top of the mountain at Annapurna, Nepal, which is the 10th highest mountain in the world. And to this day, my husband will say, I'm not sure if you made the right decision or if you were just oxygen oxygen deprived, but okay, you gave away a very lucrative career because you decided you didn't want to be licensed by the state, you didn't want to be part of that system, and what could I do to make things different from there? And so in this writing group, which is called The Pen is Greater Than the Sword, we, uh, we, you know, we, we talk about collaboration, we talk about how we can make, um, make our ideas approachable and tangible and attractive to other people. Thank you. Um, so when we think about the 60s, what do you guys think about? I kind of think about, you know, I didn't grow up in America, so maybe my perception of things is a little different, but I tend to think about, you know, the the national conventions, the, the uh, police coming out, sort of on force police state. I think about things like uh, the Black Panther Party and what that meant. Um, the Yippies, as I mentioned, A.B. Hoffman and Jim Rubens. And then I like to think, you know, Chicago Aid, that whole era which really sort of spawned something. It seems like that was the last time before right now where people were kind of poking the bear. And, you know, Rich is not here right now, but he has a metaphor about poking the bear, and I'll get into it towards the end. But, um, you know, I, I try to think, okay, if we were to reimagine liberty and the things they were kind of trying to do in the 60s for now what would that make us and you know there are lots of monikers and labels and tags that we can throw at people for the most part i think those things are useless because we're individuals and it's like oh i could say this group is like this but it's like well no you know once you get to know the individuals i will judge you on your individual actions but you know, if we were to be something, would we be the uppity slaves? You know, would we be hippies with guns? Would we be, um, you know, the hipster militia? Who knows, right? I mean, there are definitely labels that could be tagged onto us, and it's up to us to sort of decide what we want to own in terms of what, as the mass collaboration, we want to be sending out there. And the tension, and I had said earlier it would be about balance, 
The tension there is finding the balance between individualism and collaboration. So when I also look at the 60s, I love to look at what we're doing here, and it's kind of choice that there are examples of people doing really cool stuff. And I love that it's being recorded. I would like to, one of my takeaways today would be, you know, we need to be writing more, we need to be capturing this in book form so that we can really show people about it. But you know, right or wrong, good or bad, I think, personally, Robin Hooding was awesome and is awesome. What's good about that activism is it's, um, and I think especially once it became uh, very non-confrontational and it just sort of became a, we're doing this, we're benefiting our friends and neighbors and we are stealing the king's tariff. That's awesome, that's beautiful, I think that's great. You know, in the past, people um, have done similar activism to what A.B. Hoffman and the Yippies used to do, and that would be uh, tilting at the windmills, or you know, levitating the Federal Reserve is what they did in the 60s. They would do that down here, in, uh, down in Concord years ago. The Cannings would do that, and the Cannings were quite instrumental in getting me to move here. You know, there's things like the Chalking Eight in Manchester, where you know there was a, a bad cop situation. A bunch of cops beat up a uh, a guy at a bar, and of course, the very weak. Yes, I said that. Blue Hampshire and whoever else wants to quote me. The weak and evil AG's office in the state has exonerated police officer after police officer for things that would not happen to a mere mundane. And that is unacceptable. That being said, because now the heel of the state will come down on, on us, of course, is can some of us mention here places where hardcore 60s activism happened? LA. LA. Boston. Boston. Selma. Okay. I, I, I mean, I'm going a little more for like Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco. Um, New York, Detroit. All right, then the question becomes, what do these places kind of have in common today? They're like the worst of the worst of the police state, socialism, search you, no rights places. And I think that's something that we should at a minim minimum put a pen in because the question becomes, and we'll talk about it a little more, when you're poking the bear, what do you want the outcome to be? I didn't verify this with Ian before the time, but I recall reading something where when he went to uh, jail for one of his activisms, the city council had like some meeting and they were like, you know what we should do while this guy's gone? We should uh, put up a fence around the gazebo in downtown Keene, put some floodlights in there, and then, yeah. And I was like, can you imagine if Ian Freeman goes to jail and when he comes out, the outcome of his activism is like a little fucking little police statey <laughs> plantation right there in downtown Keene. I would take the position that's not the outcomes we want, right? We want to actually shine the light and we want to constantly be winning. I don't want more police state. There's a lot of activism and creative and crazy ideas that I could share where I'm like, well, this would certainly hurry up the police state. But I'm like, okay, it's been 50 years since the 60s. Do we want to like hurry up? Frankly, we have some protections that make the hurrying up of it pretty hard. So what we should be doing is while we still have a chance is scale it back. If you look at, you know, the 60s, they took both approaches. We had the peaceful hippies, we had the people putting the daisies in the guns and, you know, at I don't know if that was specifically Kent State, but we've all seen the photos. 
We also had the Black Panther Party, another speaker I've reached out to to get to Liberty Forum, and I have had my knuckles wrapped. I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to do about it. But I tracked down Bobby Seale, who's the founder of the Black Panther Party. And I was like, I think you should come speak at Liberty Forum in the same way that I think Jimmy Wales should come speak at Liberty Forum and that I think uh, Lynn Ulbricht or Ross Ulbricht should speak there. If we are going to function in an actual voluntarist society, the only tools we have is persuasion and dialogue. That's it. If you can't force or bully someone to do what you want, then you have to convince them that your idea is better. And I don't think you want to convince them at the barrel of a gun, because if you do, you're them. When you do activism, I think one of the questions that all of us should ask ourselves is, what is the goal of what I'm about to do? What am I trying to accomplish? Not only what am I trying to accomplish, what is my motivation for doing it? Who is the audience I'm doing it for? And why am I doing it? And we have to really consider these things because if you're just out there to like stroke your own ego, you're not gonna get from point A to point B. You know, if you, if you end up in, and I, I mean, I think it's sorry that Chris just walked out because my example was, if you end up in a shouting match with your neighbor and it's just, you know, it's like, is this activism? I would say no. So is this just stupid and it makes everyone look bad? Maybe. That's up to everyone's personal opinion. But I think that we really need to start to think about that balance. And part of that balance and part of that peaceful evolution is actually us as individuals evolving as well. You know, we're all individualists and we're all like, hey, I'm awesome. Like, I love the way I think and I like the way I am. And I'm like, what? I, no, how could I be a creepitarian? Well, you're not gonna know till someone tells you, right? But you also have to get your ego out of what is going on. Because I think there is a cycle, especially for those of us who are in front of the cameras, things escalate, and maybe now's a good time for, you know, Rich, and correct me if I'm wrong with the quote, right? I talk about poking the bear all the time. And I'm like, if you're gonna poke the bear, figure out, why are you poking the bear? You know, for what audience is it? What do you think the outcome should be? Let's think it through. If you're gonna poke the bear, why are you poking the bear? And Rich's analogy, we were outside and he said, have you heard my metaphor for poking the bear? And I was like, no, I haven't, so I'm excited. And he said, well, if you poke the bear, you wanna poke it with a really sharp stick. <laughs> and when you poke it with the really sharp stick, the only way it's effective is if it mauls you back. Did I quote that right? Uh, you were close. You want me to give it to you from the microphone? Sure. <laughs> uh, that quote was uh, that the act of civil disobedience is like poking a, poking a bear with a short stick uh, sharp stick, I'm sorry, in order to demonstrate the danger of keeping and arming bears. The problem is, the problem with the method is that the demonstration is effective if and only if the demonstrator is mauled. <laughs> Thank you, and, and that was an important clarification. So my view on the world is I want to create a world where there's less mauling, <laughs> right? and possibly less pointy sticks, but you know, that's open to debate. I think if everyone just has a stick, we're in a polite society, right? The playing field's level. But I don't like seeing my friends go to jail. I don't like seeing my friends get hurt, and I don't like the idea of you 
you poke the bear, you poke the bear, and, and you think you're playing a game, right? You're playing for um, numbers, you're playing for views, you're playing for likes, which circles back to the ego issue. Or, but ultimately, it's like, you're poking a hungry bear. All they know and all they have is this giant system behind them that is like, I'm gonna crush you, cause I can. So it doesn't matter how noble we are or how right we are, I'm not sure that's the best tactic. So when it comes to persuasion and it comes to activism and it comes to the things from the 60s that I really actually loved and enjoyed was the fun stuff, the let's go levitate the Pentagon, right? It's like, that's silly, but it's like, that's fun, you know? I think a lot of our 420 rallies in New Hampshire have been an incredible amount of fun and really just positive and just, you know, good, beautiful vibes. Some of them have certainly been spoiled by, you know, the, the federalists and the, the police, but ultimately, if we want to go from here to there, I think from tyranny to freedom, I think one of the ways we should start to employ is to start to use art more, art as activism, so that fun, the playful, the, you know, uh, just kind of, even if it's like a bit of a what, you know, because this, one of the beautiful things in America that it still has is, and I would say it's almost one of the last vestiges for those people who are interested in the Constitution, you know, I'll just use it as sort of a guideline that you might use, you know, I don't know, the 10, stuff that's been written down, because stuff that's been written down is gonna be important towards the end of this. So with the, um, what was that? Something that was written down. The Constitution. The Constitution. <laughs> I'm a good anarchist. <laughs> the First Amendment of the Constitution, right, gives you the freedom of speech. And that gives you the right to say whatever the fuck you want to whoever the fuck you want, including the police, the president, whatever. And they are trying to clamp that down, but there are enough people out there who are like, what the fuck? I like saying fuck, you know? Sorry, we'll have to bleep this entire speech. <laughs> it's, it's because, you know, people will say to me, don't swear on stage, and that's like a red flag, to, you know, to a bull, and I'm like, I will. But the First Amendment is so important, and it captures art. And it captures art in a way where if you can just make people scratch their heads a little bit about things that are liberty oriented, I think we can really step up the game. So one of the ideas I had after um, Democratic, uh, Democratic Representative Cynthia Chase of Key, New Hampshire, came out and said the Free State Project is the single, mo the single greatest threat to the state of New Hampshire and we should try and tampen down the liberties they think they're gonna find here. And just to pause for the folks at home, think about that. An actual elected official said on the record, hey, we should take away the liberties of the people we don't like. Did we not in the 60s like kind of fight for not having xenophobia and racism and fear of the other? Yes, you know, like those are the good things the 60s gave us. So when I heard that quote, what I wanted to do, and I got talked down, and I think, you know, it might have been one of those ones, and I honestly don't know, would it been, have been good or bad activism? But my idea was we should go to the state house, we should have two water fountains, We'll put them on the lawn, one water fountain will say granite staters, and one water fountain would say free staters. <laughs> and I'm from South Africa, right? So like, you know, and, and maybe there are people here who are old enough to remember like the bad days, but people are like, no, that kind of, what? No, like don't do that. That's just gonna upset people, right? Do it! Do it! <laughs> 
So I don't know if that was good or bad, but that's the kind of stuff. Like I would love to get like a group of people together where we can brainstorm and we could be like, here are 40 crazy ideas. Which one do we think is going to work that is going to actually hit those targets of we're changing. I hate saying these words. Like if someone could just help me come up with better words, but hearts and minds. I mean, I hate those words so hard. If we could change minds, like in our writing group, we had a prompt once, and I was like, write what you think the opposite of force is. And people wrote these beautiful essays, and I was like busy doing a hundred other things, and I just wrote the opposite of force is knowledge, right? So if we can get people to know and to understand and to think about things, then we win the debate. And the way to do that is to shake them up. But don't shake them up so hard where they're like, I thought it was a smoothie and now I'm butter. You know, <laughs> that was a terrible metaphor. <laughs> so um, so my, my last point on Cynthia was, um, I read this quote somewhere and I don't even remember where, but it really stuck out in my mind and it's something I want to just start to use because it amuses me. Um, and actually, and Ian, feel free to steal this one too. But it's basically like, stop ruining our bad name. <laughs> so, um, how do we how do we make more effective art? How do we put it within the realm of the First Amendment? Really make it clear, and you know, and the gamut there runs a really wide spectrum. You know, from egging police cars to dropping dollar bills on the um, stock exchange, which the Yippies did as well. It was a very dramatic moment. They went in. It used to be open in those days, and in fact, they they. This is an example of we we're gonna have fun. Oh no, we have a you know. The, uh, TSA check station at Keene's gazebo. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of spectrum where you're like, okay, wait. And they had just, they snuck into the stock exchange and they had suitcases full of dollar bills and they just threw it onto the pit and the stock exchange people went wild. wild. <laughs> and they were just like dollars. And so all these newspapers had these photos of these people at the stock exchange just grabbing for money, you know. And um, yeah, and it was, it was pretty powerful. I would like to say that if we are, if we are, I believe we are writing history. I think what we're doing here with the Free State Project, with the people who are moving is historical. I actually think it's epic. I think it could potentially change the world forever. I don't mean these things as hubris. I actually believe that in my heart. I look at just 10% of people who've pledged have moved here and look what we have spawned. We have activist centers, we have writing groups, we have cooking groups, we have people who do kung fu together, we have people who feed the homeless, we have people who just get together and hang out, people play D&D, &D. but whatever anyone is doing, what they firmly, firmly believe in their hearts is they have a passion for liberty. And we're the first 10%. So imagine freezing that in time. Let's freeze where we are right now and be like, imagine when the other 90% comes. It's going to be insane. And everyone in this room will become a thought leader because you will have been here first, you will have had the dialogue and the communication that we've talked about. Maybe you will find balance in your life where you can say, I need to get my ego out of this situation because what's good for the mass collaboration? And that is a personal quest for everyone in this room. The older you get, the more you think about these things. You know, when you're young, you're like gung-ho and you're like, I'm just gonna do this. Let the chips fall where they may. I'm trying to give those people some tools to say, why am I doing this? Who am I doing it for? How does this help? Does this hurt? Am I just doing this because like, I need some hits? Or am I doing this because this actually furthers 
liberty. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I have this writing group. It was something I decided to do because I wanted to inspire 10 or 12 people to work with me, that we would write an anthology, maybe work with me and um, write books. The reason we care about, you know, the Bobby Seals and the uh, Rubens and the uh, A.B. Hoffmans is because they wrote books. These are not the best books in the world. Like, they're actually pretty shabby. They're almost like cut together, zini kind of things. Doesn't matter, like 50 years later, I can get that on Kindle and be like, could you guys at least have sized this? You know, like, okay, there's like one word here, one word there, but I get the gist. I want to inspire everyone who's here and everyone who's gonna move as part of this movement to come build something from the ground up, something that is fundamentally positioned to change the world, to put a bunch of people who really, 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 really get it together. And we're not, we don't always agree. In fact, we often don't agree. But that's the fun part. I think the important parts are to remember, we agree on like 98% of the stuff. That 2% is where our egos get into it and everyone's like, I gotta win this slugfest. I'm saying let's evolve beyond that. Let's actually take the slogan for you know, Free Keen, the blog that Ian runs, which is peaceful evolution. Let's really take that to heart. And let's take those words, peaceful. Peaceful doesn't mean we have to not defend ourselves. We can defend ourselves. And you know, someone asked me about the Keen riots, right? Or mayhem, what are we calling it? What's the PC term? Um, looked kind of like riots to me, but like, you know, spoil white kid riot. <laughs> But someone said, you know, they were like, oh, why were the cops actually quite nice as compared to, say, Ferguson or, you know, stuff we've seen in Oakland or, and once again, circling back to that police state map that we drew from the 60s where it was Oakland and Berkeley and New York and Detroit and all these places, what did they do? They disarmed people. So what is an advantage we have in New Hampshire? I actually said to, to the person who asked the question, they were like, why didn't the cops just go in hard? And I was like, I think it's because here they know the people on the other side might be armed too. So an armed society is a polite society. That's what I want. When I talk about peacefulness, I don't talk about not defending yourself. I just talk about violence. My most important point is I don't ever want to philosophically be them, even if I think I'm right. It's like, well, I got to kill those people in order to have the peace. No, once you're killing people, it's all over in my book. That's my book. People are welcome to disagree. So if we have a peaceful evolution, this isn't just about the system. It's not just a peaceful evolution of the world we live in. It's a peaceful evolution of yourself as an individual. And you have to philosophically get to that point where you can understand in order to evolve as a human being, you kind of have to look in your heart and you have to ask yourself some hard questions and then you too have to change. How are we on time? Can we do Q and A? Take your time. All right. Um, so we can do. So so here's an evolution. I was like, we should stop calling it Q and A because that's lame. We should call it AMA. I might make it AMAA, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, feel free to come up and ask questions and let's get in deep and dirty. <laughs> I guess I'm quote guy today. Uh, to uh, a quote that I had from Nietzsche that kind of uh, brings forward the point that you were talking about 
uh, is be careful when you set out to fight monsters that you do not become a monster yourself. When you look too deeply into the abyss, the abyss looks also into you. That's what I love about you, Rich, is you can remember quotes. That's beautiful. I, on the other hand, can remember nothing, but, <laughs> but it's all there somehow. Um, more questions. Ask questions about how the Free State Project's doing. Chris is going to lay it down. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I have a question for you, but there's a, a couple of points you made that I want to address. When you talk about the activism of the 60s and how the places where that was most prevalent is where the worst police state activity uh, exists, I find it astounding that you fail to realize that it was the end of the system activists who gained political power and instituted those policies, not the people working outside of the system. Uh, you talk about a voluntary society, and despite the repeated PR disasters you've presided over on the subject, you still fail to recognize the difference between defensive and initiatory force by saying that we become the state by using force. Meanwhile, you don't seem to I show... I actually did not you, say you, we became the state. You, you don't I said seem to show any objection to free staters actually seeking political power to wield the force of the state. Uh, it just seems to me in a growing number of people that while the free state movement is a great thing, the free state project incorporated the organization has become completely tone deaf, completely unaccountable, and potentially even corrupt, caring about more for favor from the state than for libertarian principles. So I wonder what you have to say to that, and if there is any limit to, to how far the president of the FSP can stray from libertarian principles without losing her very high paying job. All right, sh should we take it point by point and maybe you can stay up there and we can talk about that? I don't want to have a debate. I just, you know, we can do that every day. Uh, uh, turn it into a panel if you like. No, no I, I really wouldn't feel comfortable with that, but um, I, I don't even really know where to start. The, the first one on the 60s, yes, that was one of my cards that I ended up glossing over. Uh, just because I was jumping around. Um, I, 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 I mean, I feel like I want to really address my high-paying job. <laughs> so um, for the past year, I have been paid $25 an hour. Uh, before that, since 2008, I have donated and contributed time in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to the movement. When I started taking a salary, my husband had lost his job, and we were literally like, we can't pay rent. I sold the Bitcoin I bought for $6 to pay my rent. And I was like, you know what? I do this full time. I bring value to this. If I don't, then I can't fundraise to pay my own salary. So I think it's legitimate in the same way that anyone else commercializes what they do. I think it's within free market principles. I have said to every volunteer I've worked with, if you can help me fundraise or get more money, I would like to pay everyone. Right now, I'm paying myself. You know why I'm paying myself? Because I raise my salary. With regard to losing my principles, no. I think I'm pretty solid on where I stand and what I believe. Um, do I think that uh, aggravating and poking the state with a pointy stick is the best way to go about things? No. Do I think going beyond pointy stick is uh, good for the movement? No. Do I think that in a voluntarist society there is anything wrong with saying we do not want to associate our brand with this person? No. So other than the fact that you were removed from the role for saying some pretty sketchy stuff, which several other organizations has distanced themselves from, my suggestion or recommendation would be to go to the part of my speech that related to ego and outcomes and ask yourself, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Because if it's really just about being popular, that's a shtick, that's certainly a platform that is 
a viable thing to do, but don't call yourself a liberty activist. And don't call yourself as someone part of a community. Because if we're a community, then we kind of all want to have a little bit of give and take. And I gave you several opportunities to change your position, which you chose not to do. Well, I would say that uh, if, you're, if you're talking about popularity, I think that's far more a concern for the politicos. It just so happens that a lot of people are really interested in what I have to say. And I could certainly be a lot more popular if I went around changing my positions based on the whims of public opinion. And I don't do that, which is what I think a libertarian and a libertarian, a libertarian activist is supposed to do. They're supposed to change, not change no, their positions. Not, you don't change based on the whims of public opinion. I, 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 I personally have also never changed my views. Okay. You, however, in my opinion, espouse violence and want to kill people. And that to me is different to saying we have a right to defense. And that is a conversation for another day, another panel, another, another conversation. But, you know, it's, it's I, I, I'm not gonna concede your pity party because I think that, All right, so moving on, yes. Okay, so I really loved the idea of having the you know, free stater drinking fountain and the non-free stater <laughs> drinking fountain. No, granite staters and free staters, because one day it's just gonna be granite free staters. And they're gonna be like, what happened? And it's gonna be like, we thought of it here. Well, the, the point that I wanted to make is there was a candidate running for state rep here in Keene against James Robin Hood Cleveland. And in his questionnaire to the Keene Sentinel, he said, I am the complete opposite of a free stater, which made me think that he's admitting to being a slave stater. Because if you remember back in the 1800s nice. from American history, there were the free states and the slave states. And if someone says, I'm not a free stater, they are admitting that they are a slave stater and that they want slavery. So maybe the drinking fountain should say free stater, unfree stater, or free stater, slave stater. I, I, I actually like that. I mean, I think the time has passed for the, the drinking fountain, but I love that sentiment. Hey, I was at Key Invention last year, and uh, I remember you uh, highlighted uh, what was going to go on at Liberty Forum, which will be in, in March, and you highlighted what you know the, the major um, uh, theme of Pork Fest. I was just wondering if you could enlighten people, or I don't know if it's actually in, if you have a theme yet, but I'd like to know that. Sure, great, thank you. Um, so Liberty Forum will take place this year, March 5th through the 8th, in downtown Manchester. So it's moving from Nashua, where it was previously, to Manchester, which is our biggest city of a whopping 110,000 people. And um, it's, a, it's a little later in the year, so we're hoping that will help people with the whole weather holdup. Um, our keynote speakers currently are um, Patrick Byrne, who uh, is the CEO of Overstock.com, that was the first major retailer who started to take Bitcoin. Patrick has, always been, uh, has also been working on a side project, which basically, is, as, as best I understand it without a lot of research so far, he is trying to create a bourse or an exchange that would become a Bitcoin exchange that could just pretty much jump around. And I am a big proponent to not necessarily poking the bear, but actually being like, the bear's there and the party's over here, and we just disruptively build things. That's what Uber is doing, that's what Airbnb is doing. I'd love to see someone build a food platform where you know I, uh, I moved to New Hampshire from New York City, I'm a big foodie, and I miss good ethnic food. I also live in a neighborhood with a lot of Nepalese people, some people from Africa, and I'm like, why don't we have just like a exchange where I can be like, can I come by? Like, you know, if people just cooked six extra dinners and your neighbors are like, yeah, that sounds awesome for dinner. I want that. So um, 
That did not answer the question at all. I'm not even sure where I went with that. Okay, Liberty Forum. So that's Patrick Byrne. He wants to do the Bourse, um, the exchange, Bitcoin exchange. Um, and I'm hoping he's going to talk more about that when he comes up. We have um, Jeff Tucker, who always comes back. We love having him. He's such a wonderful man. Uh, we have Sheriff Mack is coming out. Um, we we have, um, we have several um, other speakers. There's a lot of hovering in terms of asks that are out that when they land, it's either going to be awesome or terrifying. Um, I, I, I will say this, and actually, I won't say it. Oh, look at me being grown up. OK, <laughs> so that's Liberty Forum. So that's March 5th through the 8th. Uh, Pork Fest, uh, the Porcupine Freedom Festival, will take place June 22nd through the 29th. Uh, we're still figuring out what the theme is there. We really hope to trigger the move as soon as possible. It won't, won't be by Pork Fest. But it's sort of the idea of, do we go you know, tabula rasa? Is it a whole new blank slate? Do we? go, which I'm sort of leaning towards, more in a Burning Man voluntarist direction where there are very clear rules and it's a little more artsy and, you know, a safe environment and we kind of make a balance and that balance is personal responsibility and freedom and really talk about those concepts. So Pork Fest pretty much right now just has a pin in it. No one's sure what's happening with that. I'm not even sure who's doing it. Liberty Forum is coming a clip. We really, 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 really need to sell tickets. So everyone should go out and buy their tickets because this is a much bigger hotel and I want to see it be robust and full and kind of the starting point of can we do it in 2015. Ian's worked really hard to put this together and I think that it would make him really happy if uh, you and Chris gave each other a hug maybe before the end of the weekend or maybe after, <laughs> just, just throwing that out there. I, you know, and just to be clear, you know, a, a, a lot of things are personal associations. People wear different hats for different jobs. Um, I think Chris and I have always had a fairly civil experience, except <laughs> you're an asshole, self-declared and I'm kind of an asshole, undeclared. <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, but certainly I, I, people have to associate and not associate according to what they want. And, and, you know, and I think, Chris, I think you're a smart guy. I just actually think you could be 100% more effective if you figured out what that kink was in your own ego that drives you to just push it that one level too far. And then I think if you can do the peaceful evolution, I'd be happy to hug you, honey. All right, I think that is the conclusion of our um, always amusing yet disastrous <laughs> keynote speaker. <laughs> but I appreciate that everyone came out to listen and thank you so much for your time and I would love to see everyone again at Liberty Forum in March. Thank you. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.